Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Today we're going to take a look at indigenous peoples and many of the contributions they're making as well as some of the challenges that they confront. Also, we're going to take a look at one United Nations organization to see what it's doing to provide assistance to indigenous peoples around the world. My guest is an expert in this area. My guest today is Ms. Chandra Roy Henriksen. Ms. Chandra Roy Henriksen is the Chief of the Secretariat of the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. Chandra Roy Henriksen, welcome to today's Global mm -hmm. Connections program. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I appreciate you being with me. We did this taping about five years ago and you were just coming in and launching this and it's come a long way in a very mm -hmm. short period of time. Let's start, before we get into your forum, let's talk a little bit about, we hear that term indigenous peoples. When I think of indigenous peoples, I think of the Maoris of New Zealand, the Aborigines of Australia, the Native Americans of North America. How do you define, is there a brief definition for indigenous mm -hmm. peoples or indigenous? Well, you know, the UN started working on a declaration, UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which was adopted in September 2007. One of the issues that they also looked into was whether there should be a definition of who are indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. Now, indigenous peoples themselves were reluctant to have this because they said you don't generally define others mm -hmm. or other peoples or etc. Why only should indigenous peoples be defined? And it's a very dynamic concept. You know, you have indigenous peoples who are in different countries. We estimate that they're about indigenous peoples about 370 million around the world in some 90 countries and in each country there's a particular context and although you use the term indigenous peoples in let's say in, uh, mm -hmm. in some countries for instance even here we're in the United States they use Native Americans First mm -hmm. Nations in other countries they use different terminology but what is very important is that wherever they may live, indigenous peoples are among the most marginalized, the most vulnerable, and often in very living in remote communities, which often have problems of access. And if you look, for instance, in, uh, for instance, I'm from Asia. In Asia, they have different terminologies for different peoples. And if, uh, and the terms that are used are often sometimes in their own languages and not easily translatable into, into uh, English, let's say. But what is very obvious for the UN was that we should not have a definition, but to mm -hmm. go forward without that. And that's why the UN Declaration was adopted without having a definition as such. What we do have is a statement of coverage, of description so that you know who the indigenous peoples are in any given context. They have a historical continuity with this mm -hmm. particular piece of land. They practice traditional lifestyles. They have distinct costumes, different colors, mm -hmm. different dresses, languages. And they are very keen on also retaining that and passing it on to their future generations. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just want to get clarify that. <laughs> okay, now you're the chief, the secretary of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. What exactly, what's the main mission of this operation and when was it formed? Okay. Why was it formed? Why was it formed? Well, we're with the, we're part of the UN Secretariat. So in mm -hmm. a way we have become our secretariat, which is a quite a small unit within the Department of Economic and Social Affairs. And within that in the Division for Social Policy Development, we are a small unit and we work as the substantive unit on indigenous mm -hmm. issues, indigenous peoples within the UN Secretariat. Our secondary function, I mean, the main reason why we were established in a way is because the, there is the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. This was established by the Economic and Social Council mm -hmm. in 2000. And the reason for its establishment was because Indigenous peoples wanted to have a body at the UN at a high level, not just uh, at any level, but at a high level which would have some input into the decision-making processes of the UN. And so the permanent forum was established by ECOSOC resolution in 2000. And then the first session was held in 2002. The permanent forum is quite unique within the UN system. It is a body which is composed of 16 members. Eight are appointed, elected by member states, and eight are appointed by the president of ECOSOC based on consultations with the regional groups mm -hmm. and based on nominations from indigenous uh, 
communities around the world, indigenous peoples around the world. The 16 members operate together and they are expert members and they provide advice through recommendations to the Economic Council and through the Economic and Social Council to the UN system, to different UN agencies mm -hmm. when working on different issues, development, health, science, technology, children. So that's the main area of the mm -hmm. forum's work. But mm -hmm. the reason why it was established was in response to demands by indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. And speaking of being established, in 1994, I think it was, the UN General Assembly declared August 9th as World Indigenous Peoples Day. What is the significance of that? Uh, this 9th August was marks the first time that the UN had a meeting on indigenous peoples. It was the UN Working Group on Indigenous Populations, as it was known, and this was in Geneva at the UN. Since then, 9th August, since 1994, when it was picked up and uh, identified by the UN as being the Indigenous Peoples, International Day of the World's Indigenous Peoples, since then it has become like a rallying call and it is increasingly being celebrated around the world by member states, by UN agencies and by indigenous peoples themselves. And it has, and here also at headquarters we always commemorate it. We identify a specific issue that should be the focus for that, uh, for that year and you know, it, we have a small event to commemorate the event mm -hmm. that day. Wonderful. Now, just in November of this year, the United Nations, I think it was Fifth Committee or one of the committees, oh, Third Committee, uh, set up the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. What exactly does that entail? What does is, what is this resolution okay. include? Not all of the, <laughs> the inclusion, but uh, the main thrust of that resolution. It's an annual resolution that was adopted by the Third Committee and then also adopted by the General Assembly itself all member states and this year's resolution was adopted without a vote meaning it was already agreed and the main areas that the resolution of this year picks up on is it reiterates the general assembly's decision that in 2017 it will be 10 years since the un declaration of the rights of indigenous peoples was adopted so 2017 there'll be a uh, event to mark the 10th year anniversary of the declaration. This will be held during the Permanent Forum's annual session in April, May the next year. A second very important uh, element of this decision of the General Assembly is that 2019 has been declared as the International Year of Indigenous Languages. And this is very much in response to a uh, urgent need to address this issue because indigenous people's languages are dying out. Mm -hmm. Many of them are dying out. There's fewer and fewer speakers and a lot of it, there's, you know, we need to do something very urgently to make sure we keep this. Otherwise, this is a, you know, it's a world heritage. It's mm -hmm. part of the world's biodiversity. And of course, the other one, the very important one is on the declaration that to reiterate the commitment of member states to the declaration. Mm -hmm. What are, I, I know the indigenous peoples, oh, let's talk about some of the contributions they make and some of the major challenges they're confronting right now. And I know it may differ from maybe Australia to North America to wherever it might be, mm -hmm. but what are some of the major contributions that indigenous peoples make, not only to their own culture, but also to the world at large? And then we'll get into some of the problem mm -hmm. areas. Some problem areas. Uh, major contributions of indigenous peoples, well, the main one now that we're all looking at very much is climate change. Mm -hmm. And when you look at indigenous peoples, they are at the forefront of climate change. And for instance, I was just recalling the SG, the Secretary General, when he went on a visit to Greenland or to, you know, and mm -hmm. to, to the Arctic, he mentioned this. And we all know that the glaciers are melting. How, whether the, when the glaciers are melting, it's not just in the Arctic, it's also, let's say, in the Himalayas or in the Andes then how does that affect indigenous peoples? Mm -hmm. Many of these peoples are living in remote communities. They're living in areas which are still pristine to some extent. Of course, there's a whole lot of uh, dispossession and devastation. But in those areas where they live, indigenous peoples have much to contribute to climate change, traditional knowledge systems. How do they keep the areas verdant? How are they environmentally sustainable? Those are some of the contributions that indigenous peoples make, in addition to all their folklore, their rich <coughs> culture and heritage. Mm 
And you mentioned climate change. That is affecting all of us, without a doubt, but indigenous peoples in particular to a large degree. I know you read articles about how the glaciers are disappearing at an alarming rate in Nepal. In Bolivia, on the Altiplano, the high plain, the high table area of Bolivia, the glaciers are disappearing, and that's the only water supply for the people who live in that area. It's really, we're reaching a crisis proportion, at a crisis level, as far as climate change is concerned. We look at the Amazon basin. That, uh, again, that was an area that's been ravaged for years and years through trying to convert the forest into some type of farmland or maybe development or something like that. But th these are pristine natural areas that we really need to refortify our efforts to preserve, do we not? Because they, if we lose them, we've lost the lungs of the earth to a large degree, especially with rainforests. I fully agree because, you know, you look at the uh, Amazon, you know, from the permanent forum mm -hmm. sessions every year, we have many hundreds of people coming and speaking and the stories they bring, the experiences they bring, the perspectives, these are very important, but these are all like calls for help, calls for urgent detection. You know, the glaciers are melting, how is this affecting our crops? How is this affecting our water? Water is, you know, without water we don't exist. We can't survive. How is this affecting the water supply? How? What is the level of contamination of the water, for instance? If you look at that, it's not just coming in, there's pollution. These are all issues that are very much, you know, very, very urgent to address. And you, in the Amazon forests, which are, as you said very correctly, what we describe as the lungs of the earth, and there are other lungs around, mm -hmm. But these are disappearing at a f an alarming rate. And at the rate we're going, if that something is not done, there's going to be very, very, we won't have much lungs left. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have no lungs, we'll have no air, that's the yeah, problem. Yeah, very, very and important. We're talking about, the, before we get off the rainforest and the, and the jungle areas of the world, there are also a lot of beneficial medicines that come out of that area, uh, out of those, mm -hmm. uh, the rainforest, are there not? I mean, it's not just timber, not just uh, land that could be uh, developed for farming, which we hope we won't do that, mm -hmm. but there are a lot of uh, positive effects for society as a whole, is there not? Mm -hmm. Well, this is one of the things with indigenous peoples. I was talking a little bit earlier on traditional knowledge, traditional knowledge systems, and that's how they have the uh, medicines, let's say. And I remember when I was growing up, I come from an indigenous community myself, when I was growing up, uh, my grandmother had taught us these plants, and that when you to stop bleeding, for instance, if you cut mm -hmm. the special plant, you just pluck that and you, you know, rub it on that thing and it heals. Mm -hmm. But these are also disappearing and with it will go the medicinal plants, the traditional knowledge, the healing systems, very, very mm -hmm. important loss mm -hmm. that we are going to face. It certainly is and it's something that we need to learn much more about and to try to lend a hand to make sure that these areas are not lost because it, it not will it just only affect the people in that area, but it could affect the world. I mean, literally the world mm -hmm. <laughs> as exactly. we know it today. Yeah, so yeah. it's very important. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. Mm -hmm. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We would invite our viewers to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you are involved with a PBS or community access television station, or perhaps a university or an educational institution that has an intra-campus hookup, or if you just have a website and you find the programs to be of interest and you would like to share them, Global Connections Television is provided free of charge at no cost as a public service to help us better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. Also, we from time to time take a look at the logical role of the United Nations in working on these really, really complex issues such as climate change, a refugee migration, a rainforest depletion, and a variety of others. Today we're taking a look at the indigenous peoples and my guest is an expert on this particular topic. My guest today is Ms. Chandra Roy Henriksen. Ms. Chandra Roy Henriksen is the Chief of the Secretariat of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. Chandra, we're talking about these issues that are of great importance not only to the indigenous peoples but to all of us. What, uh, I think back to uh, just last year when the uh, UN General Assembly, the all 193 member states, all countries, of the UN adopted the Sustainable Development Goals. And these were 17 logical, practical goals that are going to be focused on by not just the UN agencies, but by governments, non-governmental organizations, private sector, CEOs of various corporations, mm -hmm. 
Rotary International, Lions International, Kiwanis International, service clubs like that to try to eliminate poverty, to eliminate hunger, to focus on climate change. Uh, what are some of the, I know all 17 are important obviously, mm -hmm. but are there two or three that you focus on more, perhaps a little bit more than others? Uh, they're all intertwined <laughs> to a large degree, but are there certain ones that you, are, that the indigenous peoples are more concerned about right now? The, for the indigenous <coughs> peoples, the SDGs are in advance because they see it in terms of recognition. Because in the MDGs, the indigenous peoples were extremely um, disappointed. In the MDGs, indigenous peoples, there was no mention at all and they were largely what they call invisible. In the SDGs, there are six or seven specific references to indigenous peoples. Two of the goals on hunger, and the other one is on uh, education. Those two specifically mention indigenous peoples. And so the, that in itself is quite an achievement brought about because they were responsive member states who were committed to this issue as well as indigenous peoples requesting that these be included. And, but as you said, you know, in the 17 goals are transversal. So indigenous peoples, whether it's on um, equity, whether it's on discrimination, equality, whether it's on gender, these are all issues that are very relevant for indigenous peoples. Indigenous peoples are all, uh, also included and specifically referenced in terms of the review and follow up. So we're actually looking forward to have making sure to the member states, to the UN agencies, to everybody, to make sure that indigenous peoples and their perspectives are included in the SDGs as we go forward. We have only until 2030, so one year has already gone 14 more years, and indigenous peoples, from what I understand and from what we have heard from them, are very much looking forward to working very closely with the other partners in this. Process. And it's, it's something we all have to be involved in. Okay, I forgot, so. I'm going to mention now, and this I know nobody's going to be able to write this down, but they can always Google your office, but uh -huh. your website is un.org development backslash DESA, D-E-S-A backslash indigenous peoples. So, but they can just put in indigenous peoples mm -hmm. at the United Nations and they will Google that and it will come up with a lot more information about what we're talking about today and some of the items that we won't get to. You were talking about the conferences and mm -hmm. of course the every conference you're going to be discussing the sustainable development goals you'll be involving people in in the conference uh, first off who are how do you there are so many indigenous groups around the world how do you decide who comes to these conferences you can't have 300,000 people <laughs> at a conference it just wouldn't work but how do you do that do they do they uh, somehow or another get in touch with you or do you reach out to them to have representatives say from from the Maoris of New Zealand or, or from whatever the various uh, tribes in North America? How, do, how does that work? Uh, I'll use the permanent forum session yes, as right. an example. Yes, right, exactly, as an example, the, sure. Uh -huh. Because that's the one yes. way which is now mm -hmm. the, like the largest global gathering on mm -hmm. indigenous people's issues at the UN. So the forum itself is the 16 experts and they are the members. All the rest are observers, including member states, UN agencies, as well as indigenous peoples. For those indigenous peoples that wish to participate at the forum sessions, which are for two weeks each year, next session will be from the 24th of April to the 5th of May, 2017. We have on our website, we put up a questionnaire, a form that they have to fill up to say that we would like to come. And then they, there's a whole process because you also want to make sure that you have the right people coming. So, th but generally, you know, the UN is open we encourage people to come and speak at the forum. Of course, there is a limited speaking time and so, so on and so forth. But these are very large open gatherings. As you know, at the UN, we, this is a space for dialogue and cooperation. And that's mm -hmm. what we do encourage from the UN. Mm -hmm. And the reports that you come up with, the resolutions that you adopt, these are very substantive. They're, they are very meaningful, especially for the people with, at whom they're directed. Uh, what do you do with those? Are they shared uh, with all 193 governments at the United Nations with non-governmental organizations? Do, do you uh, try to get that information out to as many players as possible? Mm -hmm. Yes, because the forum adopts a report and the report is with their recommendations and their observations and their analysis and this is submitted to the Economic and Social Council that takes note mm -hmm. of the report. This is then shared very widely throughout the UN. We also distribute it to our networks, to our partners and to the UN agencies, many of which are directed to the UN agencies. And uh, 
th then we take it from then. Of course, now with social media, that's made it a lot more uh, easier, let's say, to access. It certainly has. <laughs> <laughs> the world of Twitter tweets and Twitter all this other stuff. Yeah, media. and you mentioned partners. Who are some of your? You couldn't identify all of them, but are no. there, there are certain areas, certain groups, certain types of businesses that you look towards, or uh, certain non-governmental organizations who uh, could provide expertise and want to be involved in your mm -hmm. issues and are anxious to participate with you and to work on these problems. Uh, for the for, uh, for from the permanent forum perspective, mm -hmm, of course, you have the member states. Mm -hmm. When you know the, m the member states do come, they do participate at the forum. We also work very closely with them throughout the year. Indigenous people's organizations from all around the world, they're also involved. Academics, universities, mm -hmm. media, but also very important key players are also the UN agencies, programs, and funds. And I just wanted to mention that, you know, in September 2014, there was a world conference. The UN uh, had a first world conference on indigenous peoples. And the two results of that, one result of that is that there was an outcome document that was discussed, agreed, negotiated by member states in close cooperation with indigenous peoples. And this was one example of very good cooperation and partnership of indigenous peoples with member states, with the UN support. And in the outcome document, one of there are a lot different commitments that the member states do make. And one of them is in terms of national action plans. Mm -hmm. So which, and as you know, most of the results that are the most important are at the country level. So what we try to do is also follow up to try to provide support to the UN states, to the member states, to the UN country teams. And we now have an additional tool which is a system-wide action plan on indigenous peoples. And this was uh, launched last year, this year in May 2016. It was actually developed under the leadership of the Secretary General and the Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs. And it has been approved and endorsed by the UN agencies. And we're now using the system-wide action plan to get better coordination, better traction of the UN's response in terms of indigenous peoples implementing the declaration, but also the SDGs. Yeah, this is also Which quite an important tool. <laughs> yeah, they certainly, it certainly is, and they certainly are. And it's very important. Now, do you monitor this to see how the uh, various governments are moving forward, or the countries are moving forward on achieving the goals or the, uh, their stated purpose or mm -hmm. the principles or whatever, the, whatever they're shooting to achieve? Mm -hmm. There was, there's, uh, from the forum, every year at the session, they have reports. The forum asks for reports, requests reports from member states, from UN agencies, from indigenous organizations, and these are all presented at the annual session. And from there, you can see what is happening, what are the mm -hmm. challenges, what are also the good practices, good examples that can be shared, emulated as inspiration for other countries or regions around the world. So that's as much as you know. You can go and of course we do our best to make sure that they are reports, that the reports mm -hmm. are included, referenced. But one of the biggest challenges we of course face is in terms of the implementation gap. If they are wonderful commitments, everybody, there is no question of the commitment, there is commitment. How do you complete these commitments? How do you achieve these, mm -hmm. these uh, aspirations that you have asked yourself to do? Mm -hmm. And the implementation is absolutely critical, mm -hmm. absolutely critical. That is one of the major challenges. <coughs> Excuse me, do you also find, and this is maybe the hardest question, the last question I'll ask you, do you find that one of your challenges is to get the media to get involved, to cover the issues, that actually affect indigenous peoples and to focus on some of the work that you're doing. Has that been a major challenge to get media involved, to help people understand them? Because we don't read a lot about them and we should be. Mm. W uh, and that's why I'm very glad to be here on this show with you. Thank you very much, Bill. One of the media is a, like a gateway. You provide the mm -hmm. pictures, the visuals, the stories behind. And this is one of the things that we're trying to encourage more and more to not just show the bad things, because sometimes when there's something really terrible happening, media rushes. But we want you to also show the good things, that these are things that are happening, indigenous peoples taking control of their lives, doing things, w indigenous women, for instance, you know, even what I'm wearing, it's, w it's, you know, it's one of these patterns of indigenous women's cultures. What are they doing? in terms of retaining the livelihoods, their cultures, their identity. And these are the good stories we would like you to focus on more. Mm -hmm. Good and bad, so you paint the real picture, but you know, 
as inspiration and mm -hmm. example for others. Exactly. And of course, that's what the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues at the United Nations is trying to do to get the word out and to work with the indigenous peoples because these issues are absolutely critical, not just to the, the indigenous peoples, to all of us around the world because we're all interlinked, we're all interconnected mm -hmm. on this planet. But Chandra Roy Henriksen, I want to thank you so very much <laughs> for a very interesting and a very thank informative you. program. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.